Chapter One of Tor, a Street Boy of Jerusalem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seville. Tor, a Street Boy of Jerusalem, by Florence Morse Kingsley. Chapter One: A Stranger Comes to Town. Tor was hungry. Hunger was a common experience in Tor's short life. He merely tightened the dingy rags about his middle and continued to stare at the group of sparrows quarreling noisily in the red dust of the street. It had occurred to Tor that the life of a sparrow must be vastly pleasanter than that of a boy. They find plenty to eat, he told himself enviously as he hugged his lean little body. With a sudden impulse, the child flung a pebble into the midst of the belligerents. The birds shook the dust from their ruffled feathers with noisy clamor of dismay, darted into the bright air, and disappeared far above the tops of the tallest houses. Tor laughed aloud, as a second idea struggled with the first in his clouded brain. Then he checked himself thoughtfully, and, winding his rags more closely about him, trotted noiselessly away down the street. Kelu, the blind beggar, for more years than one could count, on the fingers of both hands, the undisputed proprietor of a snug corner just within the Damascus gate, was shaking his brazen cup after his daily custom. The cup rattled bravely, for certain coins had already been dropped therein by the charitable. Have mercy, kind lords of Jerusalem, have mercy on the sorrows of one born blind, chanted the beggar in his whining monotone. Kind lords, beautiful ladies, only a denarius, I beseech of you, and may the blessings of heaven... The blind man paused, his quick ear catching the sound of a hesitating footfall amid the hurrying steps which passed in and out at the open gate. Now may Jove, Jehovah, and all the lesser gods be gracious unto thee, noble sir, he began. On a sudden, this professional plaint broke into a bellow of anger and alarm. Help! Thieves! Murder! he cried. My money! My hard-earned money! Someone has stolen my money! No one appearing to pay the slightest heed to his outcries, the beggar beat upon the ground in a very fury of impotent rage. Tor, standing well out of range of the whirling staff, regarded the blind man with a pleased smile. For a moment he had quite forgotten that he was hungry. <laughs> My very good master, he cried tauntingly, and who is it who will fast today, eh? And perchance tomorrow? At the sound of the shrill, childish voice, the beggar sprang to his feet with a vile imprecation. Is it thou, spawn of the dust, who hast dared rob me? He screamed, making a vicious rush in the direction of the voice. Come hither, that I may break every bone of thy thieving body. What if I choose not to be beaten? Inquired Tor, coolly evading the groping fingers of the beggar. What if I will to exchange thy good coin for bread? Yesterday... Thou gavest me naught save a beating. Today I have had but a bellyful of curses. I tell thee, I will serve thee no longer. May Jove, Jehovah, and all the lesser gods be gracious unto thee. With this mocking farewell the boy darted away, and being for the moment almost as unseeing as his late master by reason of the hunger which tore him urgently, ran straight into the arms of a man who had been curiously watching the scene from the shelter of an archway. "'Let me go!' shrieked Tor, striving with all his puny strength to writhe out of the powerful grasp of his captor. "'Let me go, I say!' Then, like the little animal that he was, he twisted about and buried his sharp white teeth in the brown hand that held him. "'Ah! Verily thou art a wolf-whelp!' cried the stranger, lightly cuffing the child's ears. Hold hard, small one, till I find how thy matters lie with the fellow yonder. Give the lad 
into the hand of his lawful master, and may heaven reward thee, noble sir, cried Kalu, making his way rapidly toward the two with the aid of his staff. The boy is mine. Alas, that I should have begotten such an undutiful one. Yet because of mine infirmity I am helpless, as thou seest, yes, but give him into my hand, and I will speedily requite him for robbing me of my last coin. Didst thou steal his money, boy? asked the stranger, stooping to look into the child's pinched face. Yes, said Tor, his big, bright eyes fixed upon the beggar and manifest terror. I was hungry. Let me go, or I will bite. Ha! <laughs> Little dog! thy teeth shall be broken for that word mumbled the beggar feeling after the child with a ferocious chuckle give him to me <laughs> not so fast friend not so fast said the stranger quietly drawing the boy away from the grimy talons outstretched to seize him this is thy son sayest thou why then is the child starving and naked whilst thou art sleek and well covered why is he bruised and bleeding like the dog thou didst call him while well, thou art whole the beggar bared his yellow teeth in a malevolent smile why herein is a marvel he said softly a noble stranger for thy speech betrayeth thee kind sir come to jerusalem for the passover perchance for love for war the gods alone know thine errand but delaying his so honourable affairs, his so important business, to look to a blind beggar's brat. Sacred fire, but I am bowed to the earth before thy most noble condescension. Who am I not worthy to touch the hem of thy honourable garment? I have said that the boy is mine. If he be hungry, if he be naked, if he be bruised, what is that to a stranger from Galilee? Truly. He is but a dog for the gutters. But even a dog hath eyes, and may be useful to one in my misfortune. Wilt thou that I give thee into the hand of thy father? asked the Galilean of the child, who no longer struggled to free himself. The man is not my father, mumbled Tor hopelessly. He will kill me. Thou liest, my son, after thy custom, put in Kalu with a triumphant chuckle it is easy to kill yes and there is no one to say me nay easy but not profitable i shall but chasten thee from thy profit as is enjoined upon every son of abraham permit me to salute thee most honourable stranger tis already over long that we keep thee from thy business my son and i and leaning forward as if to humbly kiss the stranger's robe, the beggar laid violent hands on the trembling child. Ha oh, ha! I have my fingers on thee at last, rat of the gutter. Come now, and we will settle our matters. Five denarii, it was. <laughs> Veil of the temple, what now? The stranger had forcibly relaxed the clutch of the bony fingers. Here is thy money, he said counting out from his broad palm the coins which the child passed over to him with a look of piteous appeal. Five denarii, sayest thou. As for the lad, if he hath the proper love for thee, he will doubtless return fast enough when thou art in kinder temper. If not, thou art relieved of his keep. Come with me, boy, if thou wouldst eat. Thou art a swine, screamed the beggar. Dost thou hear me, Galilean? A swine, swine, swine! Thy father also, and the father of thy father, thy mother, sacred fire, help, help! The beggar lay sprawling in the dust, under a well-directed blow from the Galilean's powerful fist. The stranger stood over him, breathing deep, his dark eyes flashing baleful fire. Then, shrugging his shoulders slightly, and muttering certain strange words under his breath, he stooped picked up the beggar quite gently, and set him in his place. Here is thy staff, thy cup, and thy money, friend, he said calmly, ignoring the torrent of imprecation which issued from the open mouth of the beggar like a foul stream. 
my master hath taught me that even such refuse as thou must be handled with love but hark ye fellow no man may defile the name of my mother and stand before peter the fisherman the beggar strained his sightless eyes after the departing footfalls peter the fisherman he repeated with a ferocious smile ah most honourable and never to be forgotten benefactor i humbly thank thy noble honour for relating to me thy name may jove jehovah and all the lesser deities enable me to suitably requite the man and i will offer of my gains a sacrifice a yearling lamb no less i will i swear it End of chapter one Chapter Two of Tor, A Street Boy of Jerusalem by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seville. Chapter Two A Sparrow Falleth. The Galilean, having thus made for himself an enemy, plunged into one of the narrow streets leading toward the temple. He was still breathing deep and thrust his pilgrim staff fiercely into the red dust of the gloomy thoroughfare. "'Who am I, that I should follow a prophet?' he demanded of himself angrily. "'If thine enemy smite thee, smite not thou again,' saith my master. "'And behold, I have smitten a stranger, and one born blind. Verily, I am glad that the Nazarene did not see me do it. "'Hold, I had forgotten the boy.' He stopped short, and presently spied Tor's small head running over with sunburnt curls peeping out from the shelter of a projecting archway. The boy's wild, bright eyes met his own defiantly. Thou wilt not catch me a second time, Galilean. The man's white teeth flashed in a quick answering smile. He who is once bitten by a wolf's whelp in future remembers and is content. Did I bite thee to bleeding, Galilean? Ay, fairly, look thou at my hand. Tor laughed aloud. It is well, he said briefly. Nay, it is not well. Tis an evil thing for a child to bite like a dog. Wilt thou eat with me, small one? I bite like a dog because I hate like a dog and hunger like a dog, replied Tor slowly. I stole from the beggar, and thou didst take the money from me by force. Which is better? Nay, Galilean, I will not eat with thee. The stranger sat down upon a stone with an air of indifference. I'm hungry, he said, and producing a brown loaf and a handful of olives from his pouch, began to eat. Little by little, the child crept nearer, Presently he stretched out one puny hand and snatched a fragment of bread, which the man carelessly let fall. "'Ah, thou,' said the Galilean, with an air of surprise, and let fall another bit. Later he placed a large piece of the bread on the stone at his side, and looked away at the tops of the houses. "'Does the hand that bleeds hurt thee over much, stranger?' inquired a small voice at his elbow. "'Does a hand that is wounded to bleeding hurt?' repeated the Galilean gravely. "'Verily, the smart is grievous. Art satisfied?' "'Why didst thou hold me when I would not?' inquired the child. "'Was my doing any business of thine?' The man shrugged his shoulders. "'Nay,' he replied doggedly. "'It was not. Moreover, I should have been attending to the beam in mine own eye. I have been taught to forbear quarrelling, even for a just cause. I am already punished, and shall be punished again. Bray a fool in a mortar, saith the wise Solomon. Yet will his folly not depart from him? Such a fool am I. Who told thee it was an evil thing to fight, Galilean? asked the boy curiously. He was sitting quite confidently now at the stranger's side, munching bread and olives. I say, it is not evil. That is, unless one is beaten. Then indeed, 
it is evil but one may always curse another i have learned diverse strong curses i i am able to curse a man or a beast in many tongues i have a master one jesus of nazareth said the galilean slowly he tells me that i must allow a man who has smitten me on the cheek to smite the other also of course after thou hast smitten thine enemy soundly he will smite thee again if he is able is thy master a gladiator god forbid murmured the galilean he stared thoughtfully at the famished child who was devouring the last crumbs of bread art thou filled he asked tor shrugged his thin shoulders is the dry bread of kidron filled with a single shower he inquired tersely i have eaten i he stopped short and fixed his bright eyes on the galilean's hurt hand which he had thrust into a fold of his tunic let me see it he added timidly wherefore wouldst thou again wet thy teeth on me tor shook his head it hurts me also now that i have eaten thy bread he faltered then to the immense astonishment of the man he burst into a passion of weeping his rough head bowed upon his scarred knees an evil-looking dog which had been hungrily watching the scene from an angle in the wall skulked rapidly toward the child and thrust his lean carcass between the two the galilean sprang to his feet with a muttered imprecation and threatening upraised staff stop cried tor in a sudden fury tis my dog tis baladin thou shalt not strike him the man looked on in horrified astonishment while the child wound his thin arms about the shaggy neck of the brute murmuring gently see here is yet a bit of bread for thee good baladin eat my friend eat it is good bread the dog licked the child's bare feet and whined his delight didst thou not know boy that dogs are unclean and evil brutes demanded the galilean with an air of profound disgust nay thou art thyself unclean and evil and i must away to my master he turned his back upon the child and strode away his head bent his eyes fixed gloomily upon the ground tor watched him furtively then with a word to the dog which obediently slunk back into his chosen lair he trotted noiselessly after the man i will see where the stranger goes he told himself the child had not followed the galilean far when the dull rumbling of chariot wheels and the sharp crack of a whip warned him out of the narrow thoroughfare he flattened himself against a convenient wall and stared greedily at the sight this could be no less than a roman official of high rank the boy knew it right well his eyes roved eagerly over the rich appointments of the chariot and fastened inquiringly on the frowning face of the man who guided the plunging horses a second man stood at the driver's side a man wearing a tunic and toga richly bordered with the imperial purple tor drew his breath sharply in pleased astonishment then he saw that the chariot was hotly pursued by a crowd of gamin like himself tis the roman pilot himself he chuckled and perchance he will presently cast out coin like grain from the fat pouch at his girdle a shrill cry burst from the child's lips as he joined the rabble at the chariot wheels to run to shout to feel the glad thud of the falling coin to wrestle fiercely in the dust to arise victorious to eat and drink the fruits of conquest this was no new thing to tor and what indeed was the random sting of a roman lash even when it chanced to fall on naked limbs or shoulders to the glory of the chase the man who held the whip plied it vigorously before and behind with loud imprecations in an unknown tongue while he who wore the imperial purple stared frowningly into vacancy 
his hands clasped loosely behind his back. Tor's swift feet gained on the chariot. Hail, great pilot, he shouted imprudently. Art deaf, art blind, art palsied? Give us now of the temple treasure. Ay, give, give. The Roman's dull eyes flashed baleful fire. The fact that he had attempted to seize large sums from the temple treasuries, and that the Jews hated him for it, was no secret in Jerusalem. But must the very gamin of the street taunt him with the fact? He snatched the lash from the driver and plied himself with a practiced hand. Tor fell back with a shriek of keenest agony. The chariot and the rabble swept on and disappeared, leaving the child writhing on the pavement like a wounded animal. The whip, fringed cruelly with the glistening barbs of steel, had lashed him full across the eyes. End of chapter 2chapter three of tor a street boy of jerusalem by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by patrick seville chapter three the man who opened his eyes to tor groaning in the wordless anguish of his hurts came a soft inquiring touch on his heaving shoulders led by that kind of instinct which guides all wounded creatures. The child had crawled away and hidden himself from unfriendly eyes in the mouth of a ruinous sewer hard by. Here he had lain long hours, exhausted with agony. The dog snuffed the small, huddled figure from head to foot with short, anxious whines. Then he fell to industriously licking the one limp brown hand which crept out from beneath the ragged tunic. Baladin, whispered Tor, and shrieked aloud with the intolerable smart of rising tears in his blinded eyes. The shriek, faint as it was, reached the ears of a second boy, who was searching carefully from side to side of the gloomy little thoroughfare. "'Tis thou, Tor?' he exclaimed, stooping to stare in at the sewer's mouth. "'Art bad hurt?' Oh, Dan, the accursed lash of the Roman smote my eyes, groaned the child, and sputtered out some strange maledictions in the Egyptian tongue which he had learned from his late master. The second boy pursed up his coarse lips into a soft whistle of comprehension. Then he bent down and stared briefly into the drooped face of the half-delirious sufferer. Body of Bacchus, he murmured smiting his bare thigh with closed fist, one more blind beggar in Jerusalem. Then, raising his fingers to his lips, he gave vent to a shrill cry of summons. It was promptly answered by the soft thud of a water-carrier's feet and the loud tinkle of his brazen cups. "'Give him to drink,' commanded Dan, indicating Tor with a grimy forefinger. The poor fool hath brought ill fortune upon himself. Tis the evil eye of a surety. With that he produced a copper coin, which the water-carrier acknowledged with a cup of water from the goat-skin on his back. I will come again at sunset and give him to drink, said the water-carrier, with a sidelong glance of fear and pity. Then the two departed, leaving Tor to his misery. How the child lived through the days and weeks that followed, only Baladin knew. The dog warmed his master's pinched body at night, keeping at bay other prowling beasts of the pariah race, which ranged the deserted streets as lawless and almost as fierce as wolves. He even fed him more than once, bringing fragments of bread and fish stolen from a vendor stall at the imminent peril of his life. Occasionally, the friendly water-carrier visited the suffering boy, and the little wild children of the street, swarming like sparrows in the streets of Jerusalem, shared their infrequent crusts with him. By low degrees the anguish of his wounds grew less poignant. The cruelly disfigured eyes were indeed wholly darkened, but they ceased to send burning shafts of fire 
to the tortured brain. The child slept fitfully, ate what he could get, and one day even smiled. This when Baladin brought him a meatless bone, laying it down at his feet with extravagant expressions of satisfaction. Nay, good Baladin, murmured Tor, patting his friend's shaggy coat. Indeed, I am not hungry today. Eat, dear beast. And he thrust the bone into the dog's mouth, and closed his sharp teeth upon it. Baladin understood, and the two rested together in the sunshine with something like real content. The charitable water-carrier had bestowed one of his brazen cups upon the blind boy, and this with his ruined eyes became his stock in trade. Little by little he learned to send forth the dolorous plaint of the blind mendicant. After a time he could find his way from place to place with the aid of the dog, and so it came to pass that there was one more blind beggar in Jerusalem. Once, during these evil days of his darkness, Tor fell in with his old master. It was on this wise, the child, grown bolder, had made his way farther than his wont into the more crowded thoroughfare of the city. And there his shrill cry for alms sounded loud and clear above the tumult of the marketplace. He rattled his cup bravely, as was the custom of the professional beggar sending forth into the unfriendly world the old familiar plaint of the beggar, Kalu. Have mercy, kind lords of Jerusalem, have mercy on the sorrows of one born blind. Kind lord, kind lady, only a denarius, I beseech thee, and may Jehovah and all the lesser gods be gracious unto thee. Now it chanced that Kalu himself had also come to the marketplace to beg alms, and, hearing the child's voice afar off, recognized it with the unearing ear of the blind. Fetch me now to the voice that crieth my cry, he commanded the one that led him. And when presently he was come to the place where Tor stood in the safe angle of two windowless walls, he stopped short with a malevolent smile. Art thou a surety blind, my son? that thou stealest my cry for alms, as thou didst once steal my money? he demanded. Tor trembled like a leaf in the wind at sound of the cruel voice. Alas, I am indeed blind, good master, he said beseechingly. Have mercy upon me, for I— The prayer ended in a muffled shriek for help, as the blind man hurled himself upon the blind child, gripping him in a very fury of malicious hatred. No one interfered. What, indeed, was the quarrel of the two beggars in an angle of the wall? Trade pressed hard in Jerusalem as elsewhere, and a man must mind not save his own business if he would prosper. So no one glanced that way when the blind man, having satisfied his lust for revenge, departed, leaving the child's limp body upon the ground. Tor was not dead. He was only bruised and beaten and choked into insensibility, and after a while he revived and crawled feebly away with the faithful Baladin. His begging cup was gone, and he no longer dared to raise his voice to crave alms from the passers-by. Occasionally one tossed him a coin or a crust, but for the most part the child crouched all day in his corner motionless starving and the days and weeks dragged by he was sitting thus one morning when the sun had climbed high enough to flood his darkened nook with yellow light tor could feel the warmth of its radiance in his chill darkness he sighed deeply and spread forth his lean hands wondering dully what it would be like to see once more he had already forgotten the blue sky and the moving clouds, the flutter of green leaves over high garden walls, and the glistening whir of bird wings in the sunshine. His night was endless, unbroken by morning gleam or noontide glory. It meant cold and hunger, and a thousand nameless miseries, which he endured because he must endure. It would stretch on and on, he thought 
to some far-off hopeless end which perchance he might sleep to awaken no more tor had looked upon such sleepers with a scared creeping of the flesh in the old days of seeing now the sleep seemed good and quite stupidly and vaguely he longed for it somewhere afar off there was shouting and a sound of voices that chanted musically the child listened with the sharpened attention which had grown to be his one defence and solace in the old days his flying feet would have borne him swiftly enough to see what was happening now he could only listen and wonder perhaps tis some great prince come to jerusalem he muttered and tried to picture to himself the gay pageant of the marching troops the gorgeous uniforms the jewelled robes of the nobles the chariots the horses and now the shouting grew louder there was a noise of swift hurrying feet of confused questions and answers while above all rose the clear musical voices of myriads of children crying in the rhythmic measures of the temple chorals hosanna to the son of david blessed blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest tor started uncertainly to his feet a strange new longing for something he knew not was stealing into his starved soul baladin whined uneasily then running to the street corner and back again to his helpless master began to utter short excited barks the child's thin fingers trailed the rough wall askingly his timid feet crept nearer to the jubilant procession hosanna hosanna to the king hosanna to the son of david he had reached the open square and fearing to go further he sank down once more in the shelter of a friendly column hot tears stealing from his darkened eyes oh baladin he moaned if i could only see and now the sweet chanting was growing momently fainter tor followed the procession in fancy it was moving toward the temple he knew that great pile of stone and marble and gold which towered above the tumultuous streets of jerusalem like the glistening palace of a dream now it had passed into the outer courts and a great and singular silence fell upon the city it was broken after what seemed hours of waiting by light and rapid footfalls tor cried an eager breathless voice where art thou tor here answered the blind boy starting to his feet and straining his sightless eyes in the direction of the voice here i am what wilt thou dan for he knew the voice in the step of his friend i have come to fetch thee to the temple breathed the boy excitedly thou must come quickly before the king has gone away to his palace did the king scatter coins among the crowd asked tor eagerly are the soldiers giving bread and alms to the people as when pilate came to jerusalem nay the man is like no other great one who ever came to jerusalem answered dan wonderingly he is verily a king though didst thou not hear the people shouting blessed is the king that cometh hark you the man is a strange king he wears no crown no jewels he hath no soldiers no money for the people he came into the city riding on the colt of an ass but the people cast even their garments upon the earth before him i saw it and shouted with the rest and because i had no coat i cut a green branch from a tree and cast it beneath the feet of his beast so also did many others when they saw what i had done they cut palm branches olive branches and acacias from fields and gardens all along the way twas a great sight the big turbans came out in a rage to shut our mouths for once they could not come thou must come why should i come said tor mourningly i am only a beggar and blind but thou shalt have thine eyes again lad cried dan exultantly the king is even now laying his hands upon the blind the lame the palsied and they see and leap and walk forthwith 
I myself have looked upon it. I will fetch thee to him. But the king would not touch me, a beggar and unclean, wailed Tor. Look you, I am no better than Beladin, and the Jews hate and despise all dogs. He would spurn me, spit upon me. Nay, I will not go. Dan laid violent hands upon the blind boy. Thou shalt go with me, he said loudly. I have said it. I will take thee to the king. Then, if he spurn thee, spit upon thee. Nay, but he will not spurn thee. I saw him, and I say that he will not. But if he heal thee not, what then? I will bring thee again to this place. There shall no harm befall thee. The two boys made their way to the temple enclosure, slipping easily among the excited multitudes, unnoticed, unnoticed, even as the little brown sparrows which flit among the great feet of horses in a crowded thoroughfare. And when they had come to the place where Jesus was, they found already gathered great numbers of blind and lame and withered and palsied, and the court ringing with the noise of their petitions mingled with the jubilant thanksgivings of those already healed. Here, get thee betwixt these two cripples, whispered Dan urgently. Fasten thou unto this man's tunic. So, go now, and come again, seeing. I will wait for thee by this third pillar. Thou wilt see me. The blind boy stumbled on behind his crippled guide, his heart beating so loud in his ears that he could not scarce hear what the voice said to him. But the shrilling touch on his sightless eyes sank to the depths of his soul. He saw Jesus. Someone was pushing him from behind. Tor yielded to the pressure without a word, without a sound. His great eyes, wide and bright, still remained fastened upon the man who had healed him. But he uttered no sound of rejoicing. To Dan, watching beside the third pillar, came a sudden, sickening sense of defeat. He made his way through the crowd, and again laid forcible hands upon Tor. "'Let me alone,' commanded Tor briefly. "'I want to look at the man.' "'Canst see him?' inquired Dan incredulously. Tor made no answer. He was thinking confusedly, vaguely, while one fixed purpose formed and lifted itself like a great, radiant light in his darkened understanding. "'I shall follow him,' he said aloud, and his thin face shone strangely. "'I shall see him always.' "'Canst thou see, lad?' cried Dan, gripping his friend's shoulders impatiently. "'Or art thou crazed, as well as blind?' Tor turned his bright eyes upon the other boy, I can see, he echoed and laughed aloud. Then, in a sudden ecstasy, he leaped upon the balustrade and shouted aloud the word which he had heard afar off in his darkness. Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Myriads of child voices took up the cry, and it arose into the blue heavens, far, far beyond the smoke of the sacrificial fires still mingled with the songs of angels before the great white throne, and there was joy in heaven. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Tor, A Street Boy of Jerusalem » by Florence Morris Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seville Chapter 4 The King, My Master The sun was setting behind the mountains before hunger, more potent than even the temple police, with its flail-like rods of office, had cleared the great court of the temple. The sick and blind, the maimed and palsied, had gone away restored. The multitude, sated with miracle and weary of shouting, followed. The Nazarene himself, looking more worn and thoughtful than his wont, also departed with the twelve, his disciples bearing themselves haughtily under the angry eyes of the priests. At last their master had declared himself before the nation. 
all the city had heard the royal acclamation the promised reign of the house of david was about to be restored in jerusalem already they felt themselves to be princes and governors in a kingdom of unimaginable splendor peter the galilean as he followed with the others after the pale potent worker of miracles who was also a king became aware of a determined clutch upon his abba and looking down beheld with amazement and displeasure the small pinched face of tor i have nothing for thee beggar he said quickly and pulled his garment impatiently away from the child's clinging touch nay but i am not begging in no wise abashed the man yonder is he thy master what is that to thee frowned the future prince of israel get thee gone the king is passing the king thy master healed me but now of blindness what is his name nay i will not lose thee till i know his name is jesus said peter unwillingly now be gone i will not said tor positively for i also have chosen him for my master but he loosed his hold on the man's garment and fell back a few paces i shall follow him he told himself simply just what he expected from his new master tor could have told no one he did not put the question to himself he was again both hungry and thirsty but he cared little for either hunger or thirst in his evil past now he tightened the rags cheerfully about his middle in the old familiar way and trotted noiselessly after the little group of men in the midst of which walked his master the child was trying dully to recall what the galilean had said concerning this man on the day he had delivered him out of the hand of kalu by the damascus gate the thought of kalu brought a new purpose uppermost when i find a convenient season from following my master i will return and beat the blind beggar even as he beat me he promised himself with a new and savage joy in his restored sight he that hath eyes is truly a god and to know this one might well be blind for a season his new master surrounded by his little guard had passed quite out of the city by this time and all were walking swiftly on one of the level roman roads which bound jerusalem to its heathen emperor tor followed unperceived in the gathering dusk of evening after a little the party reached a small village entered it and passed before a large and beautiful garden enclosure where they were evidently expected for they were immediately admitted and the doors shut fast behind them tor marked the place well then not knowing what else to do he returned to jerusalem found baladin and spent the night in one of his old haunts near the damascus gate when the child woke in the morning the marvellous events of the previous day floated before his wide eyes like the misty fragments of a half-forgotten dream was i indeed blind he asked himself or was that also an evil dream of night baladin's anxious whine recalled him more fully to his waking senses and he sprang up to find dan shying olive stones at him from a neighbouring wall sleepy head discharging another volley of stones look you lad there is much to be seen in jerusalem to-day if indeed the man restored thy sight the passover pilgrims are coming in by thousands i have already begged breakfast for me and for thee i can see as well as ever said tor briefly but i must first find my master give me the loaf and i will go beggar cried dan tossing his comrade a fragment of a loaf and a half a dozen olives what hast thou to do with a king come we will lead a merry life this week the pilgrims are laden with goods and one with light fingers and lighter heels need lack nothing the boy snapped his brown fingers and executed a sort of savage dance in the exuberance of his spirits he said do not beat thine enemy but if thine enemy smite thee let him smite thee again if he will said tor 
munching his bread reflectively. There is Kalu. He hath beaten me, not once nor twice only, but many times. Who said, do not smite thine enemy? demanded Dan, staring. My master said it. He said it to the Gadalian, not to me. I will, therefore, beat Kalu. Also, I will steal his money and give it to my master. My master, my master, mocked Dan. How dost thou know that the man will have thee for a servant? I don't know. But if I will serve him, then will he be my master, whether he will or no? And I will serve him. I have said it. How? persisted Dan. Tor stared about him reflectively. I will bring him blind folks to heal, he said at last. I can do that. Thou art a rare fool, said Dan conclusively. I am off for the pilgrim's encampment outside the walls. Look, you beggar, when thou art through with serving the king, thy master, thou wilt find me there eating the fat and drinking the sweet. And with a laugh of scorn, the boy darted away. Left to himself, Tor sat for a long time deep in thought. An astonishing picture had presented itself to his mind, born out of the unseen whence cometh every good and perfect thing in all the visible world. The child seemed to see himself leading his old master, Kalu, to the healing king, and Kalu, restored to sight, crying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Far off and faint upon the morning air, a voice arose, rising and falling in dolorous monotone. Tor knew it. It was the voice of Kalu, begging alms. He arose and ran with swift feet to the place, which he had hated and avoided even in his dreams, and there, in the familiar angle of the wall, sat the beggar, shaking his empty cup, the sun falling full upon his evil face. Tor stood quite still and gazed at the blind man with his Christ-touched eyes, and for the first time in his short life, loving pity for another welled up within him. Master, he said in a low voice. Then he drew nearer and spoke in a louder voice. Kalu! He would call no man master save one. The blind beggar beat upon his cup with his horny knuckles. Who calls me? he asked, scarce believing his truthful ears, which told him whose voice had spoken. Who calls me? he repeated, trembling. I choked the little dog to death, yet it is his voice that speaks. Thou didst not kill me, said Tor. I am alive, and see once more. Yesterday the king, my master, healed me. Lies, mumbled Kalu, shaking his great head. Thou wast always a liar. This is no lie that I tell thee. Wouldst thou receive thy sight also? Come, I will lead thee to my master. He will heal thee. Kalu reflected for a moment. Physically, he was stronger than the puny child, yet he distrusted his words. Thou art plotting mischief against me, gutter rat, he growled. I know thee. If I plotted mischief, I should have come upon thee suddenly, and run away ere thou wast aware of me, replied Tor. I am no man's fool, but I serve a new master, one Jesus. Tis for my master I do this. He heals the blind folk, therefore I fetch blind folk to him to be healed. Thus I serve my master. Wilt thou come? Kalu rose slowly to his feet. I will come, he said. But if thou hast lied to me, little dog, thou knowest the strength of my hands, and shall know again. This time I will kill thee beyond a peradventure. Tor shuddered at the familiar clutch of the knotted fingers on his slender shoulders, yet he walked bravely forward. So I serve my master, he said aloud. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Tor, a Street Boy of Jerusalem by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Patrick Seville. Chapter Five. Deep calleth unto deep. Where is the man who heals the blind? Demanded Kalu, leaning heavily on the child. Tor trembled, but he answered boldly enough. He will be in the court of the Gentiles, healing the blind. There was a great concourse of people crowding the street, which led up to the temple, and amongst them numerous cripples, palsied men on litters, sick children in the arms of anxious, wild-eyed mothers, and blind beggars, led like Kalu by willing guides. Yes, the king is in the temple, repeated Tor confidently. Then he shouted, Hosanna! in his shrill childish voice, as he had done the day before. The cry was echoed by myriads of voices, both far and near. Kalu's heavy hand descended upon his guide's curly head. Be silent, fool, he hissed. There is tumult ahead. Keep clear of the crowd, I say, and look sharp. They were near the main entrance of the temple now, and the stream of newcomers was met by the excited mob of people coming out. Imprecations, shouts, and loud angry cries blended confusedly with the whir of moving wings, for a great cloud of doves hovered uncertainly over the place, now flying, now settling on the roofs and pinnacles of the marble porticoes. Kalu stopped determinedly and snuffed the air like an animal. "'What is going on within?' he demanded of Tor. The question was answered by a woman in a foreign headdress, who chanced to pause in the crowd beside them. "'The Nazarene has thrust out sellers of doves and the money-changers from the great court,' she said laughingly. "'With these eyes I saw it. The prophet cast down the tables with no gentle hand. Loose the doves, and drove out the craven Jews before him like a flock of frightened sheep.' "'Twas a great sight. Also the money was scattered all over the court among the multitude. Even I, a Gentile, am the richer for it.' "'Money?' exclaimed the blind beggar greedily. "'Come, let us go in. I would I had eyes that I might glean of this harvest.' "'The man gives eyes also for the asking,' said the woman indifferently. "'I have witnessed miracles of healing till I am weary of them.' The Jew is a great magician, surely, but his own countrymen hate him, and the Romans care not for miracles, so betwixt the two he will perchance fall to the ground. Tor was not listening. He was watching for a good opening through which to pilot his blind charge. When thou art healed, thou wilt become a servant of the king, he said softly in the ear of the blind beggar. I and will I? sneered Kalu. And what will I do then? Fetch blind folks to be healed, said the child simply. Now I see him, he added with joyful certainty. Do but follow quickly, and thou shalt be blind no longer. Like the showers and sunshine of the Father which blesses the good and the evil alike through all the years of all the ages, so was the healing power of him who manifested the father and every act of his life and so it came to pass that many came to be healed of blindness in those last great days and went away with seeing eyes and blind souls Kalu's first act after receiving his sight was to stare hard at tor i am minded to know thee again he said thoughtfully the boy shivered beneath his gaze Kalu, with seeing eyes, was even more terrible than Kalu blind. Those devouring eyes were roving like the eyes of a beast of prey over the excited crowd. They fastened at last on a man who stood not far from the Nazarene. I know that man's voice, said Kalu. Who and what is he? He is a servant of the king, said Tor. His name is Peter. His name is Peter, repeated Kalu, and struck his palms together softly. He turned and without another word plunged into the crowd and was gone. Tor forgot him presently. He was edging his way nearer and nearer to the wondrous voice. Jesus was teaching the people 
and his words fell upon the child's ignorant ears with a strange and potent charm. He could not understand, but he listened because he loved, and listening and loving he comprehended something of what was being said, even as a babe discerns the speech of its mother. Love answereth love, as deep calleth unto deep. At night Tor followed his master and the twelve, when they went forth out of the city to lodge in the house of his friends in Bethany. This time the child slept on the ground in the shelter of the garden wall, begging a crust and a cup of water from one of the villagers at dawn. No one questioned the boy, and so he was able again to follow among at their heels when the little party set out for Jerusalem. There was a withered fig tree near the wayside, and Tor heard the Galilean Peter pause and say to his master, Rabbi, behold the fig tree which thou curseth is withered away. And Jesus looked upon the withered tree and answered the Galilean on this wise, Have faith in God, for I tell thee that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou taken up and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that what he saith cometh to pass, he shall have it. Therefore I say unto you, All things whatsoever ye pray for and ask for, believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. And whensoever ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any one, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Tor was crouching in the shelter of a bush, and heard every word distinctly. His thin face burned with excitement. He said, Whosoever, he murmured. He said, Whosoever. Tor knew something of the custom of prayer. Many times he had seen the rich Pharisees standing motionless at the street corners praying. Also, he had begged in the temple court, where many persons prayed aloud. For himself, he never prayed. The God of the Jews regarded not beggars, he told himself. Now, as he crouched behind the bush, listening to the departing footsteps of the thirteen men, he began to say over to himself the word Father, which the man who had opened his eyes said so often. He repeated it softly to himself many times. Then he sprang up and followed hard after his master, vaguely comforted and glad at heart. The day was a long one, passed mainly in the great court of the Gentiles, and Tor, mingling with every gaping crowd which surrounded the Nazarene, was puzzled and troubled by much that he saw and heard. There was no shouting of Hosanna today, no royal acclamations. The people stood close in serried ranks and listened doubtfully to the strange teachings of the king in the seamless robe the king who wore no crown and whose followers bore no arms he was telling stories to the multitude stories so simple that even a beggar could understand them the child pressed close so close that he could have touched the sandaled feet of the man who had opened his eyes and so he listened to the stories of the father and his two undutiful sons the absent lord of the vineyard and his wicked servants, the generous king who made a marriage feast for his son, until it befell that the very beggars were gathered into the feast. The child smiled and trembled and wept aloud beneath the power of that wondrous voice. More than once the master's deep eyes rested upon the small upturned face with its wistful look of adoration. And once, as he was speaking, the hand of Jesus rested for a moment on the rough curls of the beggar's head. Ah, the rapture of that moment! Torn knew now deep in his heart that he was the accepted servant of the king. He could have remained there forever, listening to the stories, but the temple police began to clear away the crowd with loud authoritative cries and random thrusts of their gilded poles of office. Make way, they shouted. Make way for the holy and reverend chief priests of the honorable elders of the Sanhedrin. Through the narrow passage thus cleared, there came presently 
in great pomp and glory a stately delegation from the supreme council of the jewish hierarchy the chief priests wished to question publicly this worker of miracles this teller of strange parables who openly wrought his mighty works in the temple of jehovah without their will or permission by what authority doest thou these things they demanded and who gave thee this authority and jesus calm and unafraid answered them after their own custom with another question i also will ask you one thing he said which if ye tell me i likewise will tell you by what authority i do these things the baptism of john whence was it from heaven or from men the gorgeously robed official who had put the question glanced about him at the hostile faces of the multitude with a translucent air of scorn and contempt thus mumbling and stammering angrily in the midst of his great beard he turned and conferred in a whisper with his companions if we say from heaven he muttered the fellow will ask why then did ye not believe him i quote another but if we say from men there is the multitude to be reckoned with for all hold that john was a prophet and so they presently faced the master their fierce eyes under the glittering insignia of the priestly office glaring at the calm pale man of nazareth we know not they said and jesus answered neither tell i you by what authority i do these things the priests withdrew in sullen silence and the telling of strange stories went on but tor somehow swept from his position by the shifting crowd found himself near the defeated priests they had paused to listen with the others and were standing with folded arms and sneering faces by one of the great pillars of the portico tor slipped behind the column of a sudden all ears these men were speaking in a half whisper of the king his master they hated him tor was sure of it the fellow will ruin us if we cannot stop his blatant mouth said one listen now to his open threats the kingdom of god shall be taken away from you and shall be given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof and he calleth himself our king sneered another a pretty pass hath the chosen people come to when the rabble choose a nazaritish carpenter for king aha i laugh at him tis no time for mirth growled another the multitudes are ever agog with some new thing stoning or crucifixion is better than laughter for such a one hark you the thing must be put down and speedily i know a way and a man he the voice dropped to a low whisper and tor trembling with a vague fright and scarce knowing what he did wriggled his way through the crowd toward the white-robed figure of jesus peter the galilean was also talking excitedly with a man in the outskirts of the crowd tor fixed his eyes upon the tall broad-shouldered fisherman with some confidence i will tell him he said to himself and hovered expectantly near waiting for an opportunity to speak he must declare himself unmistakably and at once the small dark-faced man was saying with an impatient gesture this telling of pretty tales and working of miracles has gone on over long say i we should arm ourselves and make ready and the sanhedrin must be won over by some great sign from heaven we can do nothing without them and say i that the master work out his plan as it pleaseth him said peter boldly saw you not his kingly air on sunday judas he is every inch a king i tell thee and able to make of us princes and high priests ay and to sweep away all oppressors by the word of his mouth able perhaps muttered judas shaking his head but i doubt him the man careth nothing for money nothing for power i know him what are his plans 
Does anyone know them? Do we, who are nearest him, dare ask him? He is, perchance, nothing more than a dreamer, and our ambitions and hopes are founded upon the shifting sands of his visions. Nay, I know what thou wouldst say, Simon, but thou art no statesman, no patriot. I hear the chosen people groaning in their slavery. I see the iron heel of Rome about to crush out the last lingering life of the nation. Will this man save us? Can he, I ask, or is he? Judas choked convulsively and tore at the neck of his garment with quivering hands. I am half mad with the torture of it, he groaned. The, the waiting, the doubt, I, I fear that he... Nay, thou art a truculent and unbelieving fellow at heart, said Peter easily. Didst hear how the master answered the priests but now? I could have laughed aloud to see them slink away like whipped curs. Like whipped curs, yes, muttered the other, but they will return anon like ravening wolves unless he declare himself. Tis folly, folly, he turned and plunged hastily into the crowd, and Peter, left to himself, began to smite his great hands together softly. He hath the power to put them all to silence, he said half aloud. He will do it. Let no one fear. I fear, said Tor, suddenly speaking at the fisherman's elbow. I fear for him. What now, small one? quoth Peter, staring down at the child with a displeased shrug. Have I not told thee to keep thy distance? Yes, but I will not, said Tor doggedly. Listen, Galilean, I heard the men in long robes speak of him. They hate him. They will kill him if they can. Take care of him, thou. My master can take care of himself, boy, said Peter boastfully. He is a king. Also, I am his servant. Where is thy sword, servant of a king? demanded Tor, eyeing him doubtfully. My sword? My sword? stammered the fisherman. I have no sword. Then get one, advised Tor briefly. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Tor, A Street Boy of Jerusalem by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seville. Chapter 6 Rejected of Men. The Galilean shook his great shoulders doubtfully as he stared after the small, agile figure of the boy, darting and doubling, twisting and turning through the huddled masses of people gathered about his master. By the double veil, he began, and stopped short with a perplexed frown. Swear not at all, saith my master, yet my unruly tongue doth ever betray me. Truly the tongue is a fire, tamed by no man, even not its owner. There was some new excitement brewing, for the fisherman was thrust rudely to one side by a guard of brawny temple police who advanced as before, crying out to the people to fall back in the name of the Sanhedrin. The group of men which followed close on the heels of the guard forced another profane exclamation from the unguarded lips of the Galilean. Herodians, he muttered, and Pharisees. Now what doth this portend? The question was answered by Judas, who reappeared at the moment, his dark face distorted, by a savage sneer. Wouldst thou know why these courtiers of Herod have come to the Nazarene, fisherman? Well, I can tell thee. Our chosen master hath of late permitted himself to be hailed king of the Jews. Yet hath he not pledged the nation to the support of his claim, nor even armed us, his chosen followers? What then? Herod is a paltry tetrarch of Galilee, he plots and schemes at Rome for his father's crown. Thou mayest know, fisherman, unless thy head be too thick for understanding, that the pretensions of the carpenter's son have been widely noised abroad, 
and have already reached the ears of royal Herod. Jesus of Nazareth must take heed to himself, or he will presently be dealt with after the manner of John the Baptist, or worse. Get thee behind me, prophet of evil, growled Peter. Thou hast ever the dismal cloak of the raven. What if Herod intends to acknowledge Jesus as the lawful descendant of David and the promised Messiah? The Tetrarch is, after all, a Jew, and looks for the deliverance of Israel. Judas laughed silently, his narrow eye slits shooting arrows of scorn at the big fisherman. What if the stones of the temple should suddenly become armed troops for the defense of our sapient master? he asked. It might well be so, murmured Peter thoughtfully. Did he not walk upon the sea? Did he not control the lightnings and the tempest? Did he not feed the five thousand with one man's victual? Hiss now, they are speaking to him. The courtiers of Herod, garbed as Roman exquisites, perfumed and smiling, were addressing themselves to the man of Nazareth. They prefaced their words with extravagant obeisances, tendered with mock humility. Behind them stood the Pharisees, alert and watchful. Listen, repeated the fisherman, his honest face flushed with expectancy. We know that thou art true, Rabbi, began the spokesman of the party, and carest for the opinion of no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? Jesus faced his inquisitors, erect and calm, his deep eyes searching their hypocritical hearts. There was silence for a full minute, while the crowded listeners craned their necks for his reply and Judas clenched his knotted hands in a very agony of suspense. This was a supreme moment. Tribute to Caesar or no? Tribute to the usurping heathen emperor? Or allegiance to the throne of David? Which? The carpenter's son whitened slowly under the fiery eyes which scorched him with their brutal passions. Then came his answer, spoken slowly, deliberately, why tempt ye me? Give me a penny, that I may see it. The perfumed exquisite from Herod's court languidly fingered the gold pieces in his pouch with a pitying smile for his penniless pretender to a throne, and presently, drawing therefrom one of the lesser coins of the empire, gave it to the Nazarene. Whose is this image and superscription? demanded Jesus, his voice ringing out in the crowded place like the peal of a great bell. Caesar's, replied the courtier, bowing servilely at the mention of that name of power. Then came the wondrous answer, forever solving all questions of human fealty. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Instantly there arose from the multitude a great hum of approval. Well spoken! Thou hast said, Behold a Solomon in our midst! burst from one and another in deep-throated chorus. And the Pharisees, wrathful and menacing, withdrew with the crestfallen Herodians. Said I not that he was a match for the best of them? cried Peter, showing his white teeth in a great laugh of relief and triumph. Aye, our master is king of a surety. Wiser than any scribe is he, keener than a Damascus blade having two edges. But Judas groaned aloud. What a moment to have declared himself, he muttered, and lost, ay, lost for ever. My God, what and who is the man? Tor had wriggled his small body through the dense crowd, back to the feet of Jesus, where he crouched ready to spring like a faithful dog at the throat of any man who should threaten his master. I have no sword, muttered the child to himself, but I have two hands well furnished with nails also. 
I have teeth like the teeth of Baladin. Let the man in long robes beware. But as yet no man durst lay so much as a finger on that seamless robe. Other tempters wearing great turbans, bearded, scowling, came to ask mocking questions concerning the resurrection, and on the insensate ears of the multitude fell those significant words which the world has neither comprehended nor believed to this day. But as touching as the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Afterward the Pharisees, rejoicing in the discomfiture of their hated rivals, the Sadducees, gathered again like barking wolves about a hunted quarry. Master, asked one of them hypocritically, which is the great commandment in the law? For they argued, if we can but draw this witless carpenter's son into a discussion on the law, we shall be able to put him to open shame before the multitude. Jesus answered the scribe without hesitation, The first commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. The second is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. He who had asked the question trembled under the searching eyes of the Nazarene. Of a sudden, those familiar words of the temple ritual blazed within his darkened soul like a great light, and he answered truth with truth. Master, thou hast well said that he is one, and there is none other but he, and to love him with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus said to this man, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. But upon the others, who were openly sneering at their spokesmen and muttering anathemas in their great beards, he presently launched the most terrible words ever spoken to man. Ghastly woes upon woes reverberated in their astonished ears, while all the rottenness of their guilty hearts was suddenly torn open and laid bare for the rabble to gaze upon. Serpents, offspring of vipers, he called them, and hissing, crawling, stinging, they crept away to their dens in murderous haste, while the fickle multitude, roused to a very frenzy of excitement, rocked and wept under the prophetic wail of his closing words, heavy with swift approaching doom. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stoneth them that are sent unto her, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Judas, who had heard and seen all, staggered away, blind and crazed with anger and despair. Ruin, ruin! he muttered. I see naught but black ruin. In his rash folly the man hath cut the last rope of safety. There is but one chance. One. He must again quell the storm he has raised about our ears with the word of his power, and I, yes, I, will force him to it, I swear it. In that same hour the beggar, Tor, saw and heard what he has never forgotten to this moment of his eternity, nor yet will forget. Certain Greeks had come up to keep the Passover at Jerusalem, for they had abandoned the pagan rites of Rome and Athens, and were trying to serve the invisible Jehovah. These heard speedily of the new prophet, who gathered the whole city to hear him in the temple, and they desired mightily to see him. 
when one will see Jesus, even to this hour, his desire is granted to him. So then these Gentiles presently set their longing eyes upon the man they sought. And Jesus, looking with prophetic gaze adown the vista of coming centuries, saw in their foreigners, with their clear, fair faces and candid eyes, those who should truly accept him as their king, understanding as the Jews could not the glories of his invisible kingdom, and seeing thus all that must be, he said to those around him, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And again he said, Except a grain of wheat fall into the earth and die, it abideth by itself alone. But if it die, it beareth much fruit. He that loveth his life loseth it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will the Father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came a great voice out of the unseen. I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people heard the sound of the voice, and trembled. But not to every man is it given to hear aright. So some said it thundered, and rolled foolish eyes toward the cloudless heavens. Others, awe-stricken, whispered, An angel hath spoken to him. To these Jesus spoke presently, This voice hath not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Then one of the scribes, shaken out of his hypocrisy by the thunder of that celestial voice, asked in all sincerity, We have heard out of the law that the Christ abideth for ever, and hath saith thou, The Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And Jesus, divinely patient, answered once again, Yet a little while is the light among you. Walk while ye have the light, that darkness overtake you not. And he that walketh in the darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe on the light, that ye may become sons of light. And with that word he went away, and hid himself, and no man saw him for many hours. End of chapter 6chapter seven of tor a street boy of jerusalem by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by patrick seville chapter seven felicia stronger even than the cords of love are the cords of habit if a man has shaken a brazen cup and bellowed for alms for more than a score of years the cup and the cry will have become a part of himself, not lightly to be shaken off. Kalu, with eyes, hungered as before, and as before he coveted money for his few and evil pleasures. So it came to pass that after a day spent in sightseeing, he was again squatting comfortably in his familiar corner by the Damascus gate, his eyes closed his horny knuckles beating a monotonous accompaniment to the familiar mendicant's whine. Have mercy, kind lords of Jerusalem, have mercy on the sorrows of one born blind. Kind lords, beautiful ladies, only a denarius, I beseech of you. Tor, searching anxiously for his new master in every corner of the city, came upon the beggar unawares and stopped short in indignant amaze. Did not the king, my master, give thee sight but yesterday? he demanded. Kalu opened his eyes with a muttered malediction. Who art thou? 
he snarled, to question me. How else shall I live? Tor looked hard at the man's great bulk. There are many laborers working in the great quarries yonder, he answered slowly. The Romans pay every man of them a silver penny. Kalu replied to the suggestion with a string of curses spoken in three languages. He ended by hurling a great stone at the lad's head. Badly aimed, the missile crashed over the wall of a garden hard by. There was a moment of silence, during which Kalu scuttled rapidly away. Then a small door in the wall was suddenly thrown open, and two men darted out. They looked up and down the narrow street, and seeing no one but Tor, who stood staring in stupefied silence after the beggar, they seized the boy and dragged him into the enclosure, locking and barring the door behind them. "'Tis an evil offspring of beggars that hath done this mischief,' exclaimed one of the men angrily. "'Did I not say it?' The other man fixed his eyes on Tor. "'Didst thou throw the stone that broke the great vase yonder?' he asked. Tor's wild, bright eyes followed the man's accusing finger to the spot where an urn, carven from costly marble, lay in ruins amid a tangle of bright flowers. "'I did not throw the stone,' he said. "'Lies!' cried the first man, stamping his foot. "'Why question a dog? Give the fellow to me. I will scourge him soundly and thrust him forth. His bleeding back will, perchance, warn others of his sort to keep their distance from this palace. "'I am not a dog,' said Tor boldly. "'I am the servant of a king. I was looking for my master, and another hurled a stone at me. But because the man was lately healed of blindness, he could not throw a stone with ease, and therefore it came over the wall.' One of the men shook with laughter at this speech. "'Nay!' but thou art a pretty liar, he said at last. The servant of a king, aye, thou dost look the part rarely. May I ask thee the name of thy royal master? His name is Jesus, said Tor. I was blind, and he gave me eyes. Therefore I serve him. The faces of both men had grown suddenly serious. They exchanged significant glances. Better hold the boy till my lord's return. He will, perchance, wish to question him of the matter, said one, and the other nodding, gripped the child roughly by the shoulder, and presently thrust him into an empty scullery of an inner court. Tor flung himself against the heavy door with a sudden fury of despair. Let me out, he screamed. Let me out. I must find my master. Then, as no one paid the slightest heed to his outcries, he began to look about him for some means of escape. The one window high in the wall was heavily barred, and there was no opening in the small, dark chamber save the door by which he had entered, and this was fast locked on the outside. The boy tore at his rags like a trapped animal. Then spying a great sealed jar in one corner, he began to scratch savagely at its cover. If it be wine he muttered. I will drink my fill for once. Nay, I will do more. I will spill upon the earth all that I cannot drink. I hate the men who had thrust me into this place. Also, I hate Kalu. Some day I will kill him. Forgive, if he have aught against any one, that your father may forgive you. Who had spoken? The beggar child ceased his beast-like clawing at the sealed lid of the jar, his flushed face paled slowly. Forgive? Forgive? The words rang clearly in his bewildered ears. He sank slowly to the floor and dropped his head to his lean knees in an effort to remember. It was my master who said it, he muttered at last. He said, Forgive, that your father may forgive. Father, my father. The child's face lighted with sudden joy. He said, Whosoever asks shall have. I will ask, for I want to get out of this place, that I may follow my master. Then, in a loud, clear voice, 
after the fashion of the pharisees he had heard praying in the temple and on the corners of the streets he cried aloud father i want to get out of this place my father i want to get out father father there was a soft fumbling sound at the door who was calling asked a sweet imperious voice i am calling answered tor expectantly i want to get out i can't unlock the door answered the voice but ona can be quiet till i fetch her a moment later the sunshine streamed in through the open door revealing the figure of a very beautiful child on its threshold behind the child stood a young girl attired like a servant she was smiling broadly how didst thou come in here boy she asked staring curiously at the beggar's tear-stained face and scant rags the fat man with the red tunic put me here said tor he said i broke the vase with a stone but i did not it was marcus who shut him up said the maid pursing her lips knowingly i must shut him in again and make fast the door before marcus finds out that i have opened it come princess we be silent ona i wish to speak to the boy said the child with a gesture of command where is thy father she continued fixing her blue eyes on tor i heard thee calling him i thought it was set the slave boy he is always getting into trouble tor pointed upward vaguely i called my father who was in heaven he said i have not seen him but he causes what one asks to be done my master said it who said it my master his name is jesus he is a king he made me see i was blind thou wast blind cried the serving maid laughing incredulously nay but thine eyes are bright as stars they were not bright said tor soberly they were smitten into darkness the roman did it with his chariot whip but the king my master touched them so see i must find him i pray thee let me go let him go said the child imperiously dost thou hear me ona and stay i will give the boy my gold bracelet that father gave me yesterday nay i have said it the maid clasped her hands but princess she entreated what would the honourable lady thy mother do with me if the bracelet be missing and to a beggar lad for thou seest that he is nothing more the boy would be scourged or stoned if i found with such a jewel in his hand the child glanced doubtfully at tor from under the curling gold of her hair what shall i give thee boy she asked for i will give thee something thou hast amused me and ona here is so stupid i am quite weary of her i am hungry said tor promptly also i am thirsty also i want to get out of this place the little princess burst into a silvery laugh come with me she said imperiously and before the maid could stop her she seized the beggar child by the hand and drew him away up the steps of a marble terrace ona followed in terrified silence beneath the shadow of a silken canopy on a couch of ivory and silver cushioned with rose-colored damask reclined a lady the most beautiful lady thought tor that the sun ever shone upon the beggar's brilliant eyes sparkled with amazement and pleasure his white teeth glimmered through his scarlet lips in an innocent smile which faded before the look of haughty displeasure on the lady's fair face what is this felicia she demanded raising her hand from the pillow to a white hand loaded with gems oh my worshipful lady began ona trembling under the cold questioning eyes which were bent upon her i beseech of thee to listen to me while i be silent ona said felicia stamping her small foot i will explain i was trying to amuse thyself in the gardens as usual with this foolish ona she went on rapidly and i heard some one call 
It was this boy, that ugly, meddlesome Marcus had shut him into the cellar without food or drink. He has done nothing at all, and more than that, he is the servant of a king. I wish to give him my bracelet and let him go, but Ona disputed the matter with me, as I have forbidden her to do so. May I not do as I will with my own? Stay, my child, I will call Marcus, said the lady, smiling. He will explain. Nay, he shall not interfere, cried the spoiled child. The boy hath amused me, and Marcus shall not have him. Ho, <laughs> this Jerusalem is so dull, I am weary of it. The child threw back her head with an exaggerated gesture of lassitude, which brought another smile to the lady's lips. How hath the boy amused thee, little one? she asked languidly. If there is anything diverting about this place, I would fain hear of it. The boy was blind, mother, and the king, his master, touched his eyes, and they became bright, as thou seest them. Is not that an amusing story? What king in Jerusalem can heal blind eyes? asked the lady, turning with some curiosity to Tor. His name is Jesus, said Tor simply. The lady drew her delicate brows together. I have heard of that man, she said coldly. He is a rousing sedition among the turbulent Jews, as hath many a one before him. He will shortly be dealt with after his kind, I doubt not. He will not be hurt, said Tor positively. My father will not permit anything to befall him. Thy father? repeated the lady. And who, pray, is thy father? He is in heaven, explained Tor. He listens to me and to any one who calls. It was because I prayed to him, as my master said, that the door was opened, and now let me go, I must find my master. Stay, said the lady, frowning. I will be further amused. Wast thou always blind, before the king thy master touched thee? No, said Tor. I had my eyes as now. Then one day I pursued the Roman pilot, as he rode in his chariot and asked for denarii. He struck me with his whip, and the lash blinded me. I cursed the man many times in my blindness with strong curses that blight like a flame. But now I have forgiven him, because my master commands me to forgive, if I have aught against any one. For this saying, I have forgiven the cruel Gentile, who is hated of all Jerusalem. Also I have forgiven... Tor was interrupted by a smothered exclamation from the lady. Her blue eyes were blazing with sudden anger. Take him away, she commanded. Thrust him into the street at once. Dost thou hear, Ona? The child, Felicia, stood as if rooted to the ground in amazement, her large eyes brimming over with tears, while Ona, roused to action by the wrath in her mistress's face, seized Tor by the shoulder and hurried him through the garden, pausing only to unlock a small door in the wall. "'Run now, beggar, for thy wretched life,' whispered the girl as she pushed the boy into the street. "'This is the house of Pilate, and yonder was his wife and child.'" End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Tor, A Street Boy of Jerusalem by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seville. Chapter 8 Kalu Drives a Bargain. The dog Baladin led a lonely life in these days, confined to his own little quarter of Jerusalem by that unwritten yet inexorable law which prevails to this day among the half-wild street dogs of oriental cities he dared not follow his adopted master beyond the corner of the short dark street which was his chosen haunt after some mysterious fashion the dog was aware that should he venture alone into the streets and squares beyond he would be instantly torn in pieces tis seldom that an animal of the pariah breed shows the least regard or affection for men but Tor 
was so like a little animal himself that the heart of the great gaunt beast had gone out to him and tor responded in kind the undivided love of a beast is better than no love at all perhaps it is because of this that the heart of a dog is so loving more than once has it solaced pain that would otherwise be unbearable in the nobler heart of a child baladin was licking with anxious care a fragment of leather once worn by his little master this done he laid his ugly head upon it and dreamed a vague dream of delight in which one figure the figure of tor moved always before him suddenly he sprang up his rough coat bristling and listened then with a whine of delight bounded forward and flung himself upon the small half-naked figure that was stealing along in the shadow of the high walls tor was breathing fast and his puny chest heaved with an occasional strangling sob as he flung himself down by the dog oh baladin he whispered i can't find him what shall i do baladin covered the child's feet with warm wet kisses his great yellow-brown eyes brimming over with tears of anxious affection he moaned and gurgled and laid one hard paw on his master's knee in token of his utter allegiance tor wound his thin arms about the dog's neck and buried his face in the scanty yellow fur let us sleep baladin he said drowsily after a time and the two curled themselves in their old haunt under the dark archway and presently dreamed and slept the sound of voices lower to a hissing whisper suddenly aroused the child he touched the dog warningly and listened a name had been spoken the name of his master he was sure of it i have a score to settle with the galilean i tell thee said the whining voice of kalu the other man is nothing to me did he not heal thee of blindness demanded the second voice with a touch of impatience he did and that i will swear to since then the matter has been noised abroad and no one will give me so much as a denarius to buy my daily victual they tell me to work to dig to cut stone to build walls may the furies reward them i will not work and i will eat thou shalt eat thy fill if thou wilt do my bidding listen this man jesus who has so taken thy living from thee is either a god or a false prophet may jehovah help me but i know not what he is the priests and pharisees hate him the people are divided he must declare himself either one way or the other i have sworn that i will force him to it and i have sworn further to deliver him into the hands of the priests without tumult i have watched thee and thou art a tool fitted to my hand go thou among those of thine own sort and arouse them against the man thou canst do it thou hast a nimble tongue and the rabble will hear thee what if he be a god demanded kalu with a gesture of fear nay i will have none of it he opened my eyes and i was born blind i am afraid to lift my hand against such a man but if he be a god said the other eagerly he will make it known rather than die like a criminal hark you they will stone him or crucify him if they are able i am afraid of the man growled kalu and who art thou to do this thing i am no whining levite but thou art verily a devil i am a patriot declared the other boldly i know the man well he professes to be messiah if he is the true deliverer not a hair of his head shall be hurt if not let him die the death i have sworn it then was a short silence broken by the musical chink of silver there is naught to fear from jesus of nazareth said the voice of the man who had declared himself a patriot he would render to no man evil for evil i have heard him say it many times and i know that he is true 
he loves his enemies and forgives every one who offends not once only but seventy times seven if he prove to be messiah i shall confess my plans and my thoughts to him and he will forgive me readily i shall then be a great prince and potentate in the new kingdom this paltry sum shall be multiplied to thee thrice over i will do it said Kalu, shaking the silver pieces in his hard palms till they chinked again and i also will be forgiven after i have worked my will with the man and with the multitude the beggar laughed aloud tor shuddered at the evil sound as he lay quiet in his lair after that the silence remained unbroken and the child at length ventured to peep out from the archway the two men were just emerging into the brightly lighted square beyond and the sun falling full upon the face of Kalu's companion revealed it as the face of judas tor flung his arms about the neck of the dog o oh, baladin he whispered i must find my master if i were only a great man with a great sword how i would fight for him but the boy remained where he was for another hour till the sun had sunken behind the mountains then emerging into the twilight of the narrow street he trotted noiselessly away baladin followed at his heels like a shadow and like a shadow refused to be left behind at the accustomed boundary some vague stirring in the dog's loving heart told him that his master was going into danger and forthwith his own imminent peril was forgotten to his unbounded joy tor saw not many rods distant the figure of peter the galilean walking swiftly along with bent head he ran to him and placing himself directly in the man's way bowed himself humbly before him i beseech thee to listen to me honourable galilean he began for i have evil tidings which concern my master the dog whined uneasily and flattened his lean body against the stones the man's angry eyes cut him like a lash out of my way companion of a pariah said the galilean with profound disgust what hast thou to do with the master he strode forward shaking off with a shudder of loathing the small imploring head of the beggar child they will kill him cried tor the man said so they hate him the dog sprang forward with a low growl of anger and fastened his white teeth in the garments of the fisherman that wail of anguish in his master's voice had roused him to a frenzy the galilean raised his stout oaken staff and smelt the animal twice thrice with all his strength the gaunt body quivered dropped rolled over once and was still the jew hurried away breathing deep in his anger and disgust i am defiled he muttered for the breath of an unclean beast hath polluted my garments he glanced back over his shoulder and beheld the beggar kneeling by the body of the dog and his indignation found vent in the deep-mouthed muttered curses that same night the passover was sacrificed and all jerusalem feasted with solemn rites and decorous rejoicings but tor crouched on the stones outside one of the low dark houses within the third wall of the city he had found the galilean afar off had seen him at length with his master and the eleven enter this house the child drowsed between whiles at the hours past and the white moon looked down at him between the houses he had forgiven peter the galilean for the death of baladin even as his master had commanded and that singular peace which the world neither gives nor takes away filled his soul he could have told no man why he was so strangely content when in the old days fury would have scorched him for the moment he had forgotten the evil words of Kalu and the disciple called judas and remembering them he murmured a simple prayer to the mysterious unseen father in whom he was coming to believe with all the strength of his childish being our father will take care of my master 
he said aloud, and smiled alone in the darkness. Within the house, in the large upper chamber, Jesus sat at his last meal upon the earth, with the few whom he had chosen, knowing all things that should shortly come to pass, and understanding to the full the pitiful ignorance and darkness in the hearts of the disciples. Again they disputed amongst themselves as to which of them should be accounted greatest in that coming kingdom of glory, which the Master now told them plainly had been appointed unto him. To sit upon the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel was indeed a glorious future. They accepted the idea with complacence, but one must be greater than his fellows in any kingdom, and each of them coveted the supreme crown of power. Then Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he came forth from God, and was going to God, arose from supper, and laying aside his garments, took a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And so he came in turn to Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Lord, not my feet only, said Peter, but my hands and my head. Then came that dark moment when the man called Judas received the morsel of bread dipped in wine. What thou doest, do quickly, said the master, with a look of full understanding, which penetrated the dismal labyrinth of the man's soul like a flash of blinding light. Judas ran violently out of the house, and the darkness swallowed him. He knew himself at last. He was no eager patriot, no doubting disciple. Anxious to force a triumphant issue, he ground his teeth in a very fury of rage and hatred as he sped on his terrible mission. The beggar child, drowsing on the cold stones without, shuddered at sound of that ominous hurrying footfall. My father will take care of him, he murmured, and again slept. Within that dimly lighted upper chamber, the compassionate master was trying to prepare the little company of unsuspecting disciples for the darker hours just before them. All ye shall be offended because of me this night, he said sorrowfully, for it, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad, but after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered in his bold, positive way, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Jesus said to him, Verily, I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But the Galilean answered with exceeding vehemence, If I must die with thee, I will not deny thee. And so likewise said all the others. End of chapter 8